a welcome uh, to uh, this, this part two of the catechism as we journey through, through the catechism and explore our faith. Um, I know that it uh, looks like your, your presenter got a little shorter, a little wider, <laughs> and uh, a little balder. But, uh, so Father, Father uh, Patrick May was wonderful and took us through that first, that first part of the catechism where we looked at our the profession of faith and the creed. And uh, I'll take us through the next part, part two of the catechism, which deals with uh, the celebrating the mystery. Celebrating the mystery. We, we got to know the mystery and encounter the mystery in the first part. And in the second part, we're speaking about how we celebrate that mystery. Now that we know the revelation of Almighty God, how do we celebrate the revelation of God? How do we celebrate the mysteries he's given to us? So as we begin, we'll start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here this evening. We thank you for the gift of our faith, the gift of coming to know you and encounter you. And we ask, Lord, that you send your spirit down upon us this evening as we begin our journey through the second part of the catechism so that we might know how to celebrate the great gift that you are and all the work that you do. We ask, Lord, that as we explore this, these beautiful mysteries, that you fill our hearts with your life, and fill our hearts with your love, draw us closer to you and deeper into your heart. We ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, it's good to be, be with you all, and, and I, um, I know that, uh, that Father May uh, did a wonderful job kind of leading us through that first part. Um, it's always great to, to see all the different insights uh, and things that he drew out drew out of that, that text. Um, so today, what, what we're going to do, we're going to kind of set the stage for the second part of, of the catechism. Uh, tonight, we, we, we kind of tie the first part to the second part. And uh, in doing that, we basically, again, we, we, we come to know what we believe in our profession of faith and in the great symbols of our faith and the mystery that God has given to us. And now, now that we know that mystery, how do we celebrate that mystery? How does it, how does it kind of become incarnate in, in what we do and how we, how we think and how we, how we breathe? Because it's one thing to just to know the faith, right? It's one thing to get it in our heads, and that's, that's, that's good, but it, ha it has to be lived. It has to be lived. It has to be celebrated. You know, our, our faith, our Catholicism, is not just a, a system of beliefs. It's not just a system of beliefs that we can kind of uh, come to know and just kind of rattle off and regurgitate back to those who teach us. It's not a philosophy that is caught up in our heads. And we can just sit around and drink coffee or cocktails and just talk about. It's not something that is just in our, in our head. It's not part of just the, the spirit. But it's something that affects our very lives. It affects everything that we do, all that we are. Christianity is incarnational. It's incarnational. We are both spirit and body. We're not body, we're not merely bodies, we're not just a sum of our biological processes and, and that's it. And nor are we only spirits trapped in our bodies, waiting for the day to be released from this prison of our body. We're both body and soul. We're body and soul. Body and spirit. And so our faith is the same. Our faith makes incarnate all that we teach, all that we think, all the revelation of Almighty God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the image that is used in the first part, in the, the, the second part of the Catechism. The woman 
healed from the hemorrhage. If you remember that story in the Gospels where Jesus is going to heal Jairus' daughter, the synagogue official's daughter. He's, going to, he's on his way, and this woman comes and touches the tassel of his cloak. Touches the tassel of his cloak. She says, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. I will be healed. And so she does. And Jesus turns around and says, courage, daughter. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. And from that hour, the woman was cured. Our faith is incarnational. It's tangible. It's tangible. All of the things that we use to celebrate our faith are real things. They come through touch. It comes through words. It comes through action. It comes through physical things. We're a very physical faith. Not a philosophy, not just a statement of beliefs. Because we are both body and spirit. We're body and spirit. And so what, we, what we'll do during this second part is we will... Um, we'll first have this, this introduction, and what we're going to do here is talk about talk about liturgy. We're going to talk about uh, what that means. We're going to talk about um, the ways, the actions that we celebrate, the, the different feasts, the different days that we celebrate. And then we're going to look at the seven ways that we primarily celebrate the mystery of God's revelation, the seven sacraments. So the next session, next week, will be on baptism and confirmation. And then we'll look at the sacrament of uh, the Eucharist. And then we'll have the sacraments of healing. Then we'll have the sacraments of healing. And after that, we'll have the sacraments of holy orders and matrimony. Those are the sacraments that are at the service of the body, service of the community. Then after that, we'll talk about sacramentals and funerals, all part of how we celebrate, how we live, how we live our faith and, and the Christian mystery. So if there's one of those sessions you don't want to go to, just pick one. And you can go to, you don't have to go to that one. But no, it should, be, it should be wonderful to kind of explore a little more in depth each of those sacraments. And, and see the beauty, see how we celebrate, and what the mystery is that comes through the sacraments uh, that, that our Lord wants to give us. So when we talk about liturgy, when we talk about liturgy, we're talking about not just the Mass. So just to just as we as we begin this, we're not talking about only the liturgy of the Mass. We have liturgies in all of the other sacraments. There's a liturgical rite, there's a liturgical book. Um, we have liturgies of blessings. Different blessings have different orders. When we bless, when we bless a boat, you know that has a certain certain prayers and even a certain certain scripture. When we uh, when we bless a couple when they're engaged, or we bless a mother before childbirth, or when we bless the Advent wreath right before the, the first Sunday of Advent on that that Sunday, all of those are different liturgies. All those are different liturgies. Official liturgies of the church. A holy hour, exposition, and benediction. Those are liturgies. And so when we think about liturgy, let's think about that in a broad context, not just limit it to the holy sacrifice of the Mass when we talk about, when we talk about liturgy. So originally, the, the very origin of the word liturgy kind of means a public work. It means a work that is done Kind of, kind of by the people. It's by, by the people. Uh, the people's work. In our tradition, however, it's taken a different type of meaning. And the liturgy is our work as a participation in God's work. A participation of the people of God in the works of God. So, it, yes, it still has that idea of the, the work of the people, the people's, the people's work, but it's much more than that. It's our participation in what God is doing, what God has done, and what God is doing. And we'll see that in all of the sacraments, that Jesus did these things. And the church continues that good work, continues the good work, 
on our participation in that, in that liturgy and what he is doing and what he wants to do for this particular soul, for that particular soul. So it refers to all the ways that we participate in the, uh, in the proclamation of the word and in works of, good, of, of charity. All of that is part is of that participation. Because it's just through, it's through our participation in these liturgies that we, that we encounter the Lord, that we encounter the good works that he has done. So we encounter him in, those, in each of those liturgies, and then, not also that, we continue that good work, continue the work that he began in his life on earth. Liturgy is the action of the church. So it's the, it's the, the church's liturgy that we celebrate and that we go through. Not, it's not mine. It's, it's not another priest. It's not this bishop's or that bishop's. It's the church's liturgy. The priest is called to be faithful to that liturgy, to give to the people, to allow the people to participate in all of the wonderful ways that the church wants wants the people to participate, what the church wants to give her people as teacher and as mother. The liturgy is also the liturgy is also a participation in Christ's prayer. So it's Christ who's there praying, it's Christ who's doing the action, and we participate in that. As a priest, we participate in a particular way. As a deacon, we will participate in a particular way. As a lay person, as a member of Christ's faithful, we participate in a particular way. Now, one of the other, <coughs> one of the other things that, um, that the church says is that all of our liturgies, our catechesis. Now, the other day I had a baptism for uh, one of the second graders. They had been kind of preparing the last year to uh, to come into the church and learning, learning, uh, kind of getting caught up uh, in their in their knowledge of, of the faith, so that they could then be baptized now and then receive uh, the sacraments of first reconciliation and first communion this year with their class. And so we had, after one of our school masses, we had the whole class around the baptismal font. And the baptism took longer than most because it was really a catechesis, a time for, 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 for training and for understanding, helping the children understand what's going on. Father, Father May brought a class over recently and showed them the oils and showed them the water and the font and the candle, and explain those things about baptism. So the liturgy can be a catechesis. We say that if people want to know what we believe, come and watch how we pray. Come and watch how we celebrate. Then you'll know what we believe. Listen to the words. Watch the actions. And you'll know what we believe. When you think of the, the great missionaries uh, that have gone around the whole world, their actions were the Holy Mass and the other sacraments. And it was in that catechesis when the Benedictines went all throughout Europe. Their main mode of catechesis was the Mass. They would say, just come and watch. Come and see. Come and listen. And we can then speak. And we can speak. The liturgy is catechesis. So we understand we understand uh, the mysteries of God and how we celebrate them. When we're immersed in them, we begin to understand them, and we grow deeper into those mysteries that we heard about in part one of the Catechism. So these two quotes, one is from Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, number 10, paragraph 10. Sacrosanctum Concilium is the document from the Second Vatican Council that concerns the liturgy. It concerns the liturgy. We're coming up on the 60th anniversary in uh, 2022 of the beginning of second, the Second Vatican Council, and who knows, we might go into depth on this, this document. It's a beautiful document on the liturgy. 
The liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. It is also the font from which all her power flows. It's the summit and also the font. That's an important concept to remember as we look at all of the different sacraments and all the different liturgies that we have. That it is both the summit and the font of, our, of, of the activity and of our power. John Paul II said, Catechesis is intrinsically linked with the whole of the liturgical and sacramental activity, for it is in the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, that Christ Jesus works in fullness for the transformation of men. That's powerful. That it's in our liturgies, in our liturgies, in our sacraments, especially in the Eucharist, that our Lord Jesus works for the transformation of men. He transforms our hearts through the sacraments. He transforms our lives through the sacraments. So if we want to, to have our life transformed, we grow closer to the sacraments. We grow, grow closer to our own sacrament. What does my ordination mean? Am I living it right? Am I living it correctly? What does my baptism mean? Let me go back to my sacrament of confirmation and open up all the gifts of the Holy Spirit that I received and outpouring there. Do I often, do I think about that? Do I live the sacraments that I've received? When I look back at my marriage, do I see that? Do I, am I open to all the graces of the sacrament of marriage that, that flow forth from the Lord? That, those things transform our hearts. They transform our lives. So the liturgy is catechetical, but it also is a work of transformation. It changes us. The liturgy changes us. Now also in the liturgy, the Trinity works together. They always work together. Where you find one, you find the other. They always work together. Now, the, um, if, you, if you're remembering in uh, the story of creation in Genesis, right? The, the Father speaks the word, the Spirit hovers over the water, and life, life emerges. All three, all three present there in the act of creation. Now let's fast forward to the scene of the incarnation. When, Mary, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, you are going to bear the Son of God, he said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The whole, God sent the word, spoke, and the angel was there delivering the message to Mary. The Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of her womb just like the Holy Spirit did at creation. And life, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The same thing happened there at the Incarnation. When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, they acted together there. And at the Lord's baptism, the Lord is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon him, and John saw the Holy Spirit like a dove, in the form of a dove. And they heard the voice, the word of the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So you see the work of the Trinity in all, all throughout. They work together. They work in tandem for everything. For everything. And so it's important to, to see in our liturgies that Trinitarian work, that Trinitarian work. So as we, as, we, uh, as, we kind of, as we saw in the creed, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we kind of looked at the different aspects, who they are, and, and, what, um, and, and what the interaction is, and their mission. And here we have, they, they all have that same mission. They all do different parts of the same revelation. And they reveal each other. 
together. They reveal one another, and they reveal the mystery to us. So the work of the Father. The work of the Father, this is paragraph 1082 in the Catechism. In the Church's liturgy, the divine blessing is fully revealed and communicated. The Father is acknowledged and adored as a source and the end of all the blessings of creation and salvation. So in all the church's liturgies, you really see the Father addressed primarily. The next time you're at Mass, listen, listen for that. The Father is addressed. The Son is made present on the altar through the Spirit hovering over the elements, the bread and the wine. And we'll see that in just a, we'll see that in just a minute. So the Father is acknowledged and adored as a source in the end of all the blessings of creation and salvation. In all of our liturgies, we ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit upon the waters of this font. That's what we say in baptism. To send the, water, the Holy Spirit in the waters of this font. Now every liturgy is also the work of the Son, the work of redemption, the Paschal mystery passion, the death, and resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. So every liturgy that we have in the church is redemptive. It brings about our redemption and celebrates what we call the Paschal Mystery. Whenever you hear that, Paschal Mystery, what we're talking about is the passion, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So instead of saying all of that, we just say the Paschal Mystery. You'll hear that in the liturgies, and sometimes we can get lost, like, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean? Just think passion, death, and resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we hear that, in, especially in the, in the Mass, at the very end of the Eucharistic prayer, the priest prays through him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all power and honor are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. So we pray through him, through the Son, through Jesus Christ, because the Son is interceding still on our behalf before the Father. We pray with him. He is our brother. Because he, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we pray with him. And we pray in him. Because by our baptism, we are made one with him. And we become a member of the body of Christ. In our baptism, we are included in the body of Christ. And so we pray in him. One of the fathers of the church said we also, we can add another there. We also pray to him because he's God, right? Because he's God. But in the liturgy, we say through him and with him and in him. So in the liturgy, we also, is, is also the work of the Holy Spirit. It's also the work of the Holy Spirit. So all of the, again, all three working together. And the work of the Holy Spirit, he prepares us to encounter Christ. The Holy Spirit prepares us to encounter Jesus Christ, prepares our hearts so that when our Lord is revealed, we will be ready to welcome him, we'll be ready to recognize him, we'll be able to see him, to hear him. So he prepares, he prepares for that encounter, he prepares us for that encounter. He also, also helps us recall the mystery. That's a, anamnesis, that's a nice big Greek word, uh, one, two, no, it's too big for Scrabble, you can't use it in Scrabble, but it's, it's a nice word to use just to show, show that you know something. Anamnesis is a remembering, helps us recall the mystery, helps us recall the mystery. Right after the consecration, the priest says, therefore, we remember your death, your resurrection, and your ascension. That's the, that's the part of the Mass that we call the anamnesis, that we are we're remembering. 
We remember all the good works that God has done. We remember all of his revelation. And the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. He helps remind us of the good works the Lord has done for us and all that he's done and all the good things that, that has happened in our past and in our, in our family and our history and, and helps us remember those, recall the mysteries that we know, recall the mystery of God's revelation in our lives. He makes Christ present. Remember him hovering over the womb of our blessed mother. Hovering over the womb He's often called the spouse of Mary, right? The Holy Spirit is often called the spouse of Mary, hovering over the womb, uh, over her womb, and the Word becomes flesh and dwells, dwells among us. Now, there's a part in the Mass where we call, here's another good Greek word, I didn't put it up there, epiclesis, epiclesis. And that's when the priest lowers his hands and extends his hands over the gifts over the bread and the wine. It's called the epiclesis, where he calls down the, the, the Holy Spirit upon the bread and the wine. He asks, asks that God consecrate them and make them for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So in that motion, in that motion is the epiclesis, of calling down the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's uh, very interesting how different rites of the church that is done. Um, I was recently at a, at a Melkite Rite uh, funeral, and all the different Pauls and all the different wavings of the holy of the, the Pauls over the elements, symbolizing the Holy Spirit coming upon the gifts of bread and wine that were on the altar. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing that symbolized the coming of the Holy Spirit upon these elements, making Christ present. The Holy Spirit also creates communion. You know, it creates communion in our, uh, in our hearts, in our individually. He brings us, makes us whole, he makes us one with ourselves and our faculties. He helps make us one and whole. The Holy Spirit in that way sanctifies us, makes us whole. He also helps in the communion of one to another and creates the communion of the whole church. Only in the Holy Spirit can that really happen. That communion uh, can, be, can exist. If you remember after Pentecost, well, you don't remember, none of us were there, but if you remember the story in the Acts of the Apostles of Pentecost, right after Pentecost, the apostles, after having received the Holy Spirit, go out into Jerusalem they go out, and they start preaching. And the people there say, wait a minute, how do we all understand them? We're Persians, we're Medes, we're from Syria. We don't, we speak Greek, we speak Aramaic. They, they don't know those languages. How can we understand them? We're Jews from Rome, they don't, they don't know Latin. How are they, how, they, how can we understand them? We, we do though. The Holy Spirit brings that communion. That Pentecost reverses what happened at the Tower of Babel, the story of the Tower of Babel, right? Where they were trying to build this thing on their own power to reach heaven, to reach God. They were going to do it themselves. And they built this big tower, and then they start arguing with each other. And the Lord said, to show you this, y'all are all going to speak different languages and not going to understand each other. And that's what happened. They left, right? So that's the story of the Tower of Babel that is reversed in the Holy Spirit. Because only now can we go to God is through participation in the death, the passion, the death, and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we can have that union with Almighty God. Only through Him. Only through the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit brings the whole world together, brings the church together in that way. So the sacraments. As I mentioned, we're going to go through all of the seven sacraments uh, later, later on in all the different the, um, the, the sessions 
following this one. We'll go through the sacraments individually. So we'll talk about more of that and how it's related in each of the, each of the different sacraments. But right now, there's a couple things to, to think about and to, to talk, uh, to, to, to bring out of the text of the catechism. That the sacraments, these are sacraments of Christ. They're efficacious signs. What does that mean? That's a big word, too. Efficacious signs. They do what they look like they're doing. They actually, they, they're, they're efficacious. They, they work. It actually does what we say it does. Baptism cleanses us of sin. It makes us a, bod, a, a son, a daughter of Almighty God. That these signs and these symbols actually do the work that they are describing. The oils heal. The words, the words forgive. These signs actually are efficacious and they do that work. They were instituted by Christ. All of the sacraments were instituted by Christ. Each one of them. And we'll look at that in, uh, as we go through each of them. Each sacrament is a privileged channel of God's grace. A privileged ch channel of God's grace. God's grace comes to us through so many things, in so many different situations, in so many different uh, circumstances, through so many different people. But through these seven sacraments that instituted by Almighty God, by, by our Lord Jesus, they're privileged channels of God's grace. We know, we have, we are convinced, we, we are sure, we have a certainty that the life of God is coming to us through these seven sacraments. We have a certainty. And these seven sacraments, as we will see later on, they continue his work. They continue his work that he did here on earth. When he healed, when he forgave sins, when he instituted the Eucharist, when he blessed marriage, all of those different things he instituted here, and we continue that good work. They're entrusted to the church. The sacraments, of, they're the sacraments of the church. So we've discerned over the seven over centuries that there are these seven sacraments. These seven sacraments. The sacraments of initiation, sacraments of healing, and the sacraments that bring communion. And we'll look at all of those: baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, anointing of the sick, and we'll look at um, confession. And then we'll look at holy orders and matrimony. But these seven sacraments are sacraments that are that are by the church. She performs them. It's her her action. They've been entrusted to the church, so the church can say, "Okay, the rite of marriage will now include a Gloria if you're having mass." It wasn't that way until the marriage rite was just recently revised. I remember still a lot of us priests and deacons and musicians who do weddings look at that like, really? was, that, was that there before? Did we just miss that? Nope, we didn't miss it. It wasn't there before. But now it is in the new, in the new uh, liturgical books. Uh, the different wording that we use now, the new, the new translation of the third edition of the Novus Ordo, of the new Mass, right? So the church has that authority to do that, to give us these liturgies as ways that, in her wisdom, as our teacher and as our mother, she says, this is the best way. To, for the mysteries of this particular sacrament, of this work of Christ, to be revealed to the faithful. This is the best way to do it. And so when we see those changes from given to us by Holy Mother Church, mother and teacher, we, we look at that and we have to, we, we have to adjust. 
Because again, it's not our right, it's not our liturgy, it's not mine, it's the church's. It's the church's. And in her wisdom, she says, this is the way, this is the way that the people of God will receive as much of the mystery of Almighty God and his, his work of redemption that we can give. And that's why it changes over time. That's why it's adjusted. That's why things are added. So all of those things are, are important to keep in mind. It's, it's her action, and they're entrusted to her, and they're also for her. They're for the church. The church springs forth from them. The church springs forth from the sacraments. And the sacraments make her holy. They make us holy. They sanctify us. They continue the transformation that begins at our baptism. So she comes alive in the sacraments. She comes alive and she is sanctified. Now here are two other good Latin phrases for you. Ex opere operato and lex orandi lex credendi. So ex opere operato. So this was kind of came about in the church's teaching understanding through St. Augustine. When people were coming to him and they were saying, well, this priest or this bishop is teaching heresy or he's, or he's doing things immoral. We know that. How in the world can we receive the Eucharist from him? Or his, are his baptisms invalid because he teaches some heresy? Is his baptism invalid? And St. Augustine said, well, there's a difference. We have to make the distinction between the action that is being done and the one who performs the action. That's why the church says even today that a non-Catholic, non-Christian can baptize a little baby in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and pouring water over their head and that child is baptized. That's why a parent, if a child is in danger of death and hasn't been baptized, can go in and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and they're baptized. We won't rebaptize them. It is by the work that is done, by the very fact of the works being worked, the actions being performed, this thing happens. By the very act of the priest saying the words of institution over the bread and the wine, they become the body and blood of Christ. His holiness doesn't matter for that to happen. It doesn't matter. His teaching doesn't matter for that to happen. And so it's a wonderful way of thinking that, thank goodness that Augustine saw this and really highlighted it because it protects the church. It protects the faithful that no matter the position or the sanctity of the minister, this thing happens when we do the actions as prescribed by the church. That's important for us, right? I've had, I've had uh, some couples come to me and ask if they were still married because the priest who married them left the priesthood and left ministry. Well, well sure. Because you married one another. Neither of you married him. He didn't do the marriage. He presided over it. And some people say, well, okay, well, a priest who, who, who may have left the priesthood, or what does that mean for all of the, for, for all of the, uh, the, the confessions that he heard? All the masses that he said. Did I receive the Eucharist in Badly? Do I have to go back and confess all those sins that I confessed to him? No, you don't. You don't. No matter what he was doing at that time, no matter what was happening, because he did that, 
the, that action because he said those words of, of, um, of institution, because he said those words of, of forgiveness and absolution, those sins were forgiven. Our Lord was made present, body and blood, soul and divinity, on that altar. So that's an important thing to keep in mind and to understand as we go through, uh, as we think about the sacramental economy, the sacramental plan of, of Almighty God and of the church. The next little phrase, lex arandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of faith. The church believes as she prays. The church believes as she prays. How we pray, what we pray, shows what we believe. The law of prayer is the law of faith. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so important to pray the prayers appropriately and properly, to understand the actions in our liturgies. Because when we pray, it shows what we believe. It's very important for reverence. If we're not reverent towards the Blessed Sacrament during Mass, it kind of really shows what we believe about the Blessed Sacrament. Is that really Jesus' body and blood, soul, and divinity? If we're treating it so flippantly, if we're not respectful of even the smallest crumb that falls onto the altar, what does that say about what we believe? If we don't take care to do the baptism well, to wash the font even, to make sure it's clean, to make sure that everything is in proper order, that we have the oils correctly, that we don't just slide in there two minutes before we have to, we have to uh, attend the Mass and pray the Mass. Do we come a little early and prepare ourselves for Mass? All of those actions really show what we believe and how we believe it. And that's, that's, so this little Latin phrase can mean all kinds of deep things for us. And it's a very good examination of conscience. Does my prayer in the sacraments and does my prayer even individually Show what I believe. Does it show what I believe? So, our law of the law of prayer is the law of faith. And then we get into our worshiping style. How does the church worship? So the, the catechism breaks it down into four different uh, four different basic questions. Who celebrates? How is it celebrated? When is it celebrated, and where is it celebrated? So who does who does the celebrating? Who does the celebrating? Well, the whole Christ, the whole church, celebrates the sacraments and celebrates the mystery. Everyone does. We're united as one. We're united as one. So really, at every mass, in a sense, we're present. At every baptism, we're all present. At every confession, we're giving that forgiveness to our brother, to our sister who's in the confessional. In one sense, we're all there witnessing the vows of marriage because it's the whole church who is there, who celebrates these beautiful mysteries. Now, we all have particular functions when it gets down to the ceremony and the rite, and we should all participate as such. The church, the church encourages the, in, the priest and the deacon, if you're present, you fill that role. Fill that role. You can come celebrate. You can serve. So we all have our particular function in the body when it comes to who celebrates 
we all celebrate, you can offer the sacrifice of the Mass for a particular intention. Do you ever think about that? When you come to Mass, and you can offer that. You're a member of the faithful. You are a priest. You're a priest in the, pres in the priesthood of the laity. And you can offer that sacrifice. You can offer that sacrifice. As the priest offers it on behalf of the whole body, you can offer the sacrifice for a particular intention yourself. What a wonderful gift that is. Because in your baptism, you are a priest, prophet, and king. Priest, prophet, and king. There was a time, and you'll see it again uh, during Lent for the scrutinies, where those who are unbaptized leave the congregation after the reading of the gospel and the homily, right? So they, they leave. And then, because we've completed what, what, what used to be called the Mass of the Catechumens, then we go to the Mass of the Sanctified, the elect, right? And only those who, this used to be the case, only those who were baptized could stay for the liturgy of the Eucharist because it was an offering to God. And only those who were baptized could offer the sacrifice because of their participation in Christ through their baptism. We don't do that anymore, except for those particular Sundays uh, of the scrutinies in Lent. But it's, a wonder, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to remember and to think about, uh, but that, that distinction. The whole church, again, the whole church uh, celebrates. The church triumphant, the church suffering, the church militant, us here on earth. And how is it celebrated? How is it celebrated? You know, we, one of the great things about our church, and I mentioned at the very beginning that the church is, is incarnational. Christianity, our Catholicism is incarnational. We like stuff. We like to use our senses. We like to engage the whole person in, the mis in celebrating the mysteries of God. All that we are, every aspect of our being, right? So we try to adorn our churches, and we put stained glass, we put beautiful statues. We try to make the place beautiful. They have beautiful vestments. We have beautiful vessels. Things are beautiful, and, we, they should, that, and that beauty raises our hearts to God. And so we use our eyes to engage in the mystery. And we sit back and we listen to the Word of God. And we hear, we hear the Word of God, and we think about the Word of God as we're sitting there listening. And we also, churches smell a particular way whether it be the beeswax candles that might be used, whether it be the incense that's used. There's a particular incense. As soon as I smell it, I am back home at the Church of the Most Holy Trinity in Augusta, Georgia. Because that was the, the incense the pastor used. And immediately, it symbolizes to me sacredness, a sacred space. Something sacred is going on here. And so I should be attentive. Even our taste is engaged when we taste the body and blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Touch. We give the sign of peace. And we also do those wonderful calisthenics, the Catholic calisthenics, <laughs> up and down, sitting, kneeling, uh, jumping if you want to, Standing, kneeling, sitting. We just go up and down, up and down, up and down. But all for a particular reason, right? It's all for a particular reason. We stand when we pray so that we can be attentive. We sit 
in a receiving posture when we receive the word of God that is being proclaimed. We kneel in adoration when Almighty God is made present on the altar and when we receive him. We genuflect to the tabernacle, acknowledging the presence of Almighty God. We dip our hand in holy water. We feel that water with which we were baptized. What a beautiful thing that is. All the different little gestures, all the different little signs and symbols that we have, the smells and the bells, and we try to engage every aspect of what it means to be a human being to help us encounter Almighty God. If it leads away from that, we probably shouldn't do it. But if it helps us grow closer to the Lord, if it helps our hearts and our minds and our soul soar to heaven and enter deeper into those mysteries, then we should employ it. We should employ it. We should bring back those things that, would, that help us do that. We should think of ways that, that help us do that even further. Engaging our senses, engaging our whole being, our whole being, both body and spirit, in the celebration. So when is it celebrated? When is the mystery of God celebrated? Well, we have our liturgical year that begins in Advent and then goes as a little bit of ordinary, uh, in the Christmas season, a little bit of ordinary time, and then we have Lent and Easter, and then we have ordinary time again till Advent, uh, the liturgical year. Um, now, I, I also celebrate, we'll get to this a little later, I celebrate the extraordinary form of the Latin rite uh, off and down at the cathedral. And they had a little different nomenclature in the old calendar for, uh, for the, the times of the liturgical year, the seasons of the liturgical year, right? So we had Advent, and then you had the Sundays after Christmas, and then you had the uh, Septuagesima. All, they had all those Aza's Sundays, right? Uh, and they basically counted down until you reached the Sunday before, uh, before uh, Ash Wednesday, because Lent is called Quaresima. It's Quaresima, the time in of Lent is called Quaresima in Latin. And they just counted down to those 40 days. Then you have the season of Lent, then you have Easter, and then you have the Sundays after Easter. We still do that in the new calendar. And then you have Pentecost. But then after Pentecost, every Sunday was the such and such Sunday after Pentecost. We didn't enter ordinary time. There wasn't something called ordinary time. Time is sanctified and will always tie to that to a feast, the feast that preceded it. And so that we're always kind of brought back there. It's a set of the, the, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. It's the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. So it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting um, just to point to point that out in our liturgical year and where we've moved from in our in our tradition and our history. We celebrate the Lord's Day, the uh, the Sabbath, uh, not the uh, the Sabbath on Saturday, but we the fulfillment of Christ's resurrection, which through through that resurrection we enter into the rest of Almighty God. So at the very beginning of time, when God sanctified the seventh day, he said, enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. Well, the difficult thing with that is we lost the ability to enter into his rest when original sin came into the world. And it's only through Christ's resurrection, his passion, his death, and his resurrection and ascension that we now can enter into the eternal rest of Almighty God. So that's why we celebrate it on Sunday. 
on the day of the resurrections because through the resurrection we can now truly enter into the rest of Almighty God. And we have our feast days and our fast days. Um, it's always good to point out, you know, Lent is 40 days and Easter, the Easter season is 50. And yet everyone just thinks about how long Lent is. But which do you think the church is trying to emphasize? Easter, the Easter season, the 50 days that we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Yes, we know we have to enter into his cross. We know we have to do that. And so we do. And we fast for those, those 40 days, and then we feast for 50. But we have to have the fasts and the feasts. We have to have the fasts and the feasts. So those things mark our days. We also have different days throughout the year, of course, that are different than others. We have our big solemnities. We have our, our, our memorials where we celebrate the saints and all that. So we do have that in those feasts and those fasts. Now, where, where is it celebrated? Where is it celebrated? I love to see those, those pictures of the army chaplains um, celebrating mass on the hood of a jeep in World War II. How beautiful that is. How magnificent that is. That in the midst of all of that horror and awfulness is something sacred and beautiful and magnificent and holy. Our sacraments can be celebrated anywhere if the proper place is not available, right? If the proper place is not available, that's what's important. We do have proper places for those things. We do have a proper place to celebrate the liturgy of the Mass. We do have a proper place to celebrate a baptism. I can hear confessions anywhere, but the proper place is in the confessional, right? So we do celebrate, we celebrate the anointing of the sick anywhere. But all those things also have their proper place where they can, where they should be celebrated. So the last part of the um, of the introduction in the second part of the second part of the catechism talks about the liturgical diversity and unity of the mystery, the mystery of God's revelation that we learned about in the first part of the catechism can never be captured by any liturgical rite in any time or season or culture in the church. Because we're talking about making incarnate the mystery of Almighty God and his revelation. And we just don't have the expressions. We just don't have the expressions as human beings to ever, to ever fully make incarnate the mysteries that have been revealed. So that's why there's so many rites in the church. We have all kinds of different ways that the liturgy is celebrated, uh, and all of the liturgies are celebrated in the church. The Ambrosian rite, the Melchite rite, the Luthanian rite, the Lithuanian rite, all of those different rites all throughout the, the history of the church. They're still valid, and they're still, they're still being used uh, to this day. In the Latin rite, we have two forms of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and also the other sacraments. Uh, I've done baptisms in the extraordinary form. I've done a wedding, uh, uh, two weddings in the extraordinary form. Um, so we have the ordinary form, which is uh, the Novus Ordo, what we do uh, each and every day. And we also have the extraordinary form, which is the, what we call now the Mass of, of John the 23rd. And uh, that is where we use the Missal of uh, 1962, and that is the, the proper Missal for the extraordinary form. Uh, this November 1st, we're going to have an extraordinary form Mass at Our Lady of Good Hope on the Isle of Hope, um, and we have one at 1 o'clock at the cathedral each and every week, every Sunday. But the liturgy and culture 
so many different expressions uh, of the faith. When we go to uh, when we go to Africa or India or Latin America, it's going to look a lot different than what we might be used to in suburban America. It just is. It will. And yet it's valid. And the church celebrates that. The church celebrates that. What we do have to be careful of, though, is that the Lex Orandi is truly the Lex Credendi. That how we're worshiping, the law of our worship, truly is the law of faith. That there's no distinction between the two. That the mysteries that we, that we profess, that we believe in faith, are being celebrated in our prayer. So even in the midst of all the different cultural expressions, we still have to keep that in mind. We still have to keep that in mind. Because sometimes a cultural expression may not be a good expression of the faith and what we do believe. And people might be confused with that. And so we have to be very careful about that. So the, that's the introduction uh, and of the second part of, of how we celebrate how we celebrate uh, the mysteries that have been revealed. Uh, it's a beautiful, our faith is so beautiful, and the expressions are so beautiful in our liturgies, um, and, and we, we do have to work hard at really participating in the work of God in our liturgies and engaging all of who we are, our intellect, our senses, everything that we are should be engaged in the liturgies so that so that we can encounter and delve deeper into the mysteries that God has revealed to us. The liturgies help us enter into that mystery and delve deep into the mystery. On our part, we have to make sure that we allow all of our being to be engaged and to go deeper. And that's our prayer. That's our prayer. We celebrate our mis the mysteries of Almighty God. And we do that primarily in the seven sacraments that we'll begin to get into next week. And, uh, and we do that with all that we are. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for inviting us to participate in the mystery of who you are. We thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us, for blessing us with all that you are, all that you, all that you have. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to learn what it means to celebrate the mysteries you've given us, that you will fill us with your love, that you will fill us with your joy. Draw us, Lord, deeper into the mysteries of who you are, so that we might become one with you and rejoice forever with you in heaven. We ask this in your name and for your glory as we pray. Glory be to the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, is, is now, and ever shall, shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 